Hey, yeah, sorry I couldn't make it to that meeting this morning. I had some Google Plus, like Google Plus was giving me issues with that. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and get started. And uh, I've been given the job of introducing Ryan here. So 
you, you guys know the speaker. Okay, Ryan's now a second year um, PhD student. And uh, he came through the University of Wisconsin and graduated in genetics there. And uh, since then, he's done uh, some work, uh, you know, both in academic centers and also in industry, uh, involving basically gen human genetics, uh, uh, statistical genetics, and a little bit of population genetics. And um, he's going to be talking about some work that's going to lead into his dissertation uh, involving retinopathy of prematurity, uh, which is an eye disease and the genetics um, behind uh, this disease. So, Ryan, I'm going to let you have a go at it. So I'm going to be talking about this disease mostly today. Uh, this is a study that we're working on to try and identify genetic causes that are associated with retinopathy of prematurity, which is a disease that affects premature infants. And we haven't gotten all the way through to the data analysis stage, so this is going to be a little bit truncated. Um, when, we, when we set up this meeting, I'd already been kind of hoping that we'd be getting through to that point. So really, this is mostly just going to be about the disease and kind of what, what makes it up, how we look at it, and then talk briefly about some of the, the candidate genes that we're involved in uh, picking out right now before we go forward with the study. So first off, uh, this disease is an eye disease, and it is a, a very common cause of blindness in infants, and historically it's been linked with oxygen overexposure. Um, a lot of infants earlier, before we had subcutaneous oxygen monitoring, were affected with this, and since we've had uh, more advanced technology for monitoring oxygen in infants, it's become a bit more controllable, but as technology has gotten better for keeping premature infants alive, we have more premature infants and more severely premature infants, and so the incidence of the disease is still pretty high. Um, it was the most common cause of blindness in the 40s and 50s. I don't know, is it still the highest cause of blindness in infants? Or? The highest preventable cause. So it's still a major, major concern. Um, and it's still something that we'd like to find some sort of way to treat better than the methods that we have already, or at least ways to figure out what the important risk factors are. So what is retinopathy of prematurity? Oh, we have, sorry, this is So the main thing is that the normal vascularization procedure that happens in developing infants gets interrupted in some way. And you see this area at the top of the eye, the superior side, um, doesn't get the normal formation of, of blood vessels that you would normally see. And then over time, that procedure picks back up again, and you see the formation of this this ridge of vascular tissue. Um, and then that process, if it's left untreated, can, can cause the, the retina to warp or become disfigured in some way or to be pulled entirely off the back of the eye, which leads to total blindness. And um, one of the things that has informed treatment of this is that we can we can see that the undeveloped tissue seems to uh, excrete some kind of vascularization or angiogenic factor, which um, causes greater formation of these blood vessels and then kind of exacerbates this problem and causes it to become worse. So. The ways that we, we break this down and we say, what are the actual features of the disease? How are we going to grade this and say, how, how bad is this? What are the different cases? What's the scale that we're viewing it on? One of the main ones is we look at zone, which is described as different regions of the back of the retina, where zone one is centered around the, the macula, the center kind of blind spot area in your eye 
and zone two uh, is a larger subsection, and then zone three is even farther out. Um, and you can see that it's all kind of pushed towards the nose side uh, where that blind spot is. And in general, um, the closer in that you're observing disease, the worse it is because that means that your kind of the process of vascularization was interrupted earlier and is closer to kind of the, the central field of view of the eye, which is the more important section or the more sensitive section for vision. Um, also describe this by the clock hour that you observe it in. So you can look at the eye as being a clock face and they've got the 3, 6, 9, 12 on there. So you can say that you have different clock sections that have disease and then that comes into the way that the, uh, the disease is graded on severity. Um, another way is we look at the stage of the disease which looks at how the, the formation of this ridge progresses. You can see that the higher stages have to do with basically kind of a, a raising of this ridge and a more, I don't know how to say exactly, like a more robust entrenchment of it. <laughs> like you, you get more vascularization along it and it basically becomes more pronounced. Um, that description has also been expanded to talk about the actual retinal detachment as a stage. And so you can see kind of in this figure how the, the disease can progress in the more severe cases which cause the, the retina to actually be pulled entirely off the back of the eye, um, which clearly is not something that we would like to see. I think once you get to this point, there's really no, no treatment available. You've kind of stuck with what you got. Um, and that's kind of a, the worst case scenario. Another way um, is there is also a designation of whether you see something called plus disease or not. And plus disease is described by having more tortuosity in the blood vessels, which is kind of like windiness or twistiness. And you also see this increased blood flow, which I think they, they described as a more florid pattern. So you can kind of see these are both actually plus disease examples. But the bottom one is a more severe version of plus disease than the top one. So you can kind of see that you have that progression where you just have a lot more Blood flow, blood flow happening. You've got a much more, you know, it's less, less straight lines, more twisty lines, basically. And then this has also been extended, since it turns out that plus disease is a really, really big indicator of whether these, these infants are going to need treatment or not, there's been an extension of that to pre-plus disease, which is kind of a, precursor to plus disease or a, a lower version of plus disease, which also serves as a pretty good indicator of whether treatment should be necessary or not. Um, so what happens if you do need treatment? So we have threshold disease, which is kind of, once you've passed that point, it becomes fairly likely that the disease is going to continue progressing until it's treated or result in, in some sort of detachment or blindness. And what we look for there is you're looking for stage three disease, which was that really pronounced ridge um, in zones one or two, so close to the center of the eye in the, in the field of vision. And you're looking to see if you see the disease in five contiguous clock zones or in eight total clock zones, and then also the presence of plus disease, because all those things are pretty good indicators that the disease is going to continue progressing. For a lot of these cases, um, I think it was 90% of cases, it'll get better in general, but in about 10% of the cases, it continues to progress. Um, 
so once you identify an infant as being one that's going to require treatment, you get into different ways of treating it. And historically, what they used was cryotherapy to kind of cauterize that undeveloped area of unvascularized tissue to prevent it from releasing these angiogenic factors. And that would kind of halt the progression of the disease. Um, that was not great for the eye. It's a pretty, I don't know, pretty brutal treatment for the tissue and results in a lot of scarring. Um, now we're able to do that with laser therapy, which is a little bit better, but still results in scarring and still doesn't allow the disease to kind of regress. You're, it's basically a, an endpoint change. So once it gets to that point, those two treatments have shown really bad outcomes long term in terms of visual acuity. Like you may not be fully blind, but you may be legally blind in the majority of those cases that it's treated. Um, that's really just kind of the best approach so far. Currently, there's clinical trials. I think this is still in clinical trials for drugs that are um, angiogenesis inhibitors. And so they prevent that angiogenesis from happening. And early results have looked good in clinical trials from what I understand from the literature. So there's some problems with diagnosing the disease and recognizing infants that are going to require treatment. And first off is that there's not a ton of people who are experts in diagnosing this disease. And the availability of people who are experts, uh, expert diagnosticians for this, makes it more difficult to, to identify those cases early and identify them accurately. And then there's also um, the problem of subjectivity in a lot of diagnosis where, especially in cases of plus disease, it's very difficult to say, like, here's a, a border, like, exactly beyond this point is plus disease, and exactly before this point is not plus disease. And so because of those things, it would be really nice if we had some sort of a test that we could administer that was less subjective, and that took a lot of the guesswork out of this. And so because of that, uh, the study is looking at doing imaging and being able to see if there's a way to sort of form an automated and more empirical way of picking up on what, what cases are beyond that threshold disease. And the part that we're more interested in or that we're more, I'm more involved in is the genetic components of the disease. So if we had a genetic test that we could administer and say, like, yes, this is a, an individual that's at high risk and they could be monitored more closely, it could devote more, more effort to kind of identifying who those patients are and then tracking through the process. And hypothetically, you could also find some way of treating it that would more directly address the genetic mechanisms of the disease. Um, so when we're looking at targets, one of the other things that we look at are what other diseases are similar to this one. And there's a syndrome called fever, which is very, very close in its phenotype to uh, retinopathy of prematurity. And that has some genetic um, research done in it already because it's X-linked, and so it's a little bit easier to identify. And nori disease is another is nori disease is another um, one that has some genetic uh, basis for the mechanism of the disease. And then diabetic retinopathy and age-related macular degeneration are two other things that we're looking at for candidate genes to try and figure out how the mechanism of retinopathy of prematurity could work. So specifically, um, a lot of the major players that seem to come up are these angiogenic growth factors, um, which isn't super surprising. This VEGF, 
the vascular endothelial growth factor comes up a lot and is one of the main things that um, seems to play a role in all three or all four of these different diseases. Um, and there's already some work, like I, s I showed before, into these anti-angiogenic factors that has yielded some, some possible drugs for that target. And then IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor, is another one that comes up a whole lot. It's actually a really good predictor of whether retinopathy of prematurity will, um, I don't know, whether it will be, I can't think of it, whether infants will show retinopathy of prematurity. And growth hormones, another one. And then there's, there's a few uh, groups of signaling genes that are also implicated. And one big family of them is this Wendt family of genes, which is involved pretty closely in the fever uh, disease. And there's been a lot of studies in mouse on these genes, but not in humans, that seem to show that they could be responsible for some degree of risk in, uh, in these infants. PPO, kind of the same thing. There are some disease, or some genes that are specifically linked with fever and nori disease that have shown, they've been investigated and have shown some sort of, well, it's not super strong link, but a, a fair link. And one's this BRIS4 gene, which um, I think they've identified as possibly being responsible for something like 5 to 15 percent of the variation in, um, in retinopathy of prematurity. And then other ones that are involved in the same pathway are this T10-12 and NDP is the nori disease linked one. And then there's just sort of a whole group of other genes that seem like they're a little bit more all over the map. And a lot of these are, are involved kind of um, in different kinds of signaling or different, different signaling pathways that are kind of tangentially connected to these. And these are all, except for, I'm not sure about the extracellular molecules, but the rest of them have been in mouse and rat studies for the most part, but not in humans. So taken all together, this seems like a pretty good relatively cohesive group of genes that could form some sort of a basis for this disease. But it's, it's a pretty big group. And then you're also dealing with a lot of other things that aren't genetic in nature that we, we are going to have a harder time um, correcting for, like environmental factors. So the sample, as it stands right now, um, I think we have about 350 infants that were followed for the first year. And we have clinical data and imaging data and genetic data on those infants. So the genetic strategy for assay that we've been talking about was to do whole exome sequencing and then do SNP chip in addition to that so that we can pick up more of the regulators and promoters and other adjacent, like kind of other involved factors that might be involved in this that we wouldn't pick up with just by looking at the whole exome data. Um, that gets a little bit more complicated because for a lot of these infants, we don't have complete data. So we may have some of these things, but not all of them together. Um, so looking at the patients, the way that we have to try and figure out to pull who gets sequenced, who doesn't get sequenced, is that we have to look at who's the most likely to develop disease that doesn't develop disease and the ones that are least likely to develop disease that do develop disease. So you're kind of taking the two extremes of the distribution and then we're going to be trying to compare those to each other to look for differences. Um, and that turns out to have to do with basically being low birth weight and low gestational age and the ones that are higher birth weight and have a higher gestational age, which makes sense. Like the ones that are more premature are going to have more problems in general um, and are going to be more at risk for this disease. And the ones that have a higher weight and are, are older or that have a more close to full term 
um, are going to be less likely to develop this disease. And so then you're just basically looking at who in that low risk group does develop it and in the high risk group who doesn't. So there are some other things that we have to think about to make sure that we can detect first off that there is an effect even if we, we have the data. Because as far as power goes, we're looking at this data and there's going to be, like I said, it's subjective. Not all of these uh, infants were diagnosed by the same people. So how far can we trust that diagnosis? Especially in the case if we don't have imaging data on some of them. And then we also have to deal with the fact that we may not necessarily have a huge number of severe cases in either group. And because of that, it's going to be more difficult to try and get a big enough sample that's going to be fully representative of only the, the most severe cases. So we might have to pull from less severe cases in both sides of the tail. Um, and then another big one is just that there's a lot of environmental effects in this disease. There's a really big, um, big effect of, like I say, we have we have a population of infants that are uh, from hospitals in Mexico, and I think when we were talking about it, they said some of them don't even, they don't have blenders for the air on the, on some of these incubators. And so we're kind of comparing two different technology levels in some of these samples. So we have to make sure that we narrow this down to a sample where the environmental factors are at least um, minimized in some way that when we look at this, we don't end up paying too big of a, a price on the power and we're still able to find some sort of genetic effect on this. Um, and then the final thing is that it looks like from what's come out so far that there are differences between different populations that are pretty big for this disease. So we have to make sure that we can get kind of a, I don't know, a, a little bit more of a homogenous group of patients or at least if we're going to compare different groups from different racial backgrounds, then we have to be kind of aware of that. And we have to have a big enough sample from each of those groups that we can move forward. Um, and I think that's really pretty much all I have right now. That's kind of where we've, we've ended up. We're waiting for data to come back now, and then we're going to be moving forward with the the sequencing and the analysis, and hopefully we'll have more to talk about then. But does anybody have any questions? Or is there a case, I mean, we're, we're hoping that there's going to be an underlying genetic effect to these things that's hopefully not really involved in the environmental side of things. Like, because of that, we're hoping that we can find uh, a sample that's big enough that we can kind of say that, yes, these all have the same environmental effects, so that we can kind of rule that out. But I mean, it's talking about chicken and the egg thing to some extent. So. One thing, I know the IGF levels, there's, I think it's IGF that spikes before birth and then it changes. And so there are some signaling things and some different processes that happen that seem to indicate that this could also be something with interrupted development phases that might have a genetic. Um, you might have said this, and I, I might have missed it. Uh, did you say, is the sequencing going to be performed only on the infants? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we have, is we have an infant sample. So we have, I think all told, there's a 1,000 infants in the group, but we don't have genetic data for all of them. Okay, because um, because there are uh, genetic association methods that are family-based mm -hmm. that get around that problem of, of population. Yeah. They, um, they're not affected by population structure. So it's 
it's kind of nice when you have a really mixed group, but it also means that you need um, <clears throat> at least double or triple the number of sequences. I don't know about with, so was there, was there any pedigree data taken? Now we'd thought about trying to collect blood from parents, David, just because of the exact reason you're mentioning. But, you know, it, thought it was just logistically, it's logistically pretty hard to do that because you've got to track down both family, you know, both parents in the unit. And so just opted against that and just decided to get blood from the babies. But, you know, we're stuck with exactly the problem you mentioned. Well, uh, Eigenstrat is worth looking at. And that, um, that's a method that, uh, adjusts for population structure, but doesn't depend on having parents. Um, with these babies, how are they typically diagnosed to receive preventative treatment? Um, I don't know how we catch them at the earliest stage. Is this just, I mean, it's basically just a partnership with these hospitals where we have a group of hospitals and the ones that get identified kind of enter into the study and then they're tracked for a year, which is kind of the whole course of the disease. So we have end, like kind of end-to-end -end data, and they have uh, exams every two weeks, is it? Or every two weeks? So they have pretty regular exams throughout that period that has critical data associated with it. I was curious because that would be how you would end up comparing whether your method improves mm -hmm. over the existing approach or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sure, like how how is that? Sorry, I guess I'm a little bit confused about how to address so in that. In practice, these babies are all in the hospital. Uh, they're all in basically intensive care units, uh, and they get eye exams every two weeks. And so, um, so if you record all the eye exam results, it takes pictures of all the babies, and then someone interprets the pictures and compares them to the eye exam. So it, ideally, it's a pretty hopefully solid. Given that, do you know what the error rates are for, um, I guess, human um, classification? Yeah, well, there are some studies into agreement between people that are that kind of describe what we're kind of expecting as far as uh, disagreement between the raters. But it's it's harder to do that when we don't have imaging data for them, and I think that that might be be something that we run into because we don't have imaging data on all these babies. But if we did, then there would be a, more concrete way to kind of have the computer grade them all and then set your thresholds that way. Yeah, I, I love that, what you're getting at with these points here. Um, because if I can paraphrase that, it sort of means that the doctor's not perfect. Um, and um, <clears throat> in fact, it, it, this is true of any sort of deal. You know, two radiologists will look at the same picture and they'll get different impressions. Or um, believe it or not, two ophthalmologists will disagree uh, when they look at um, Examine the same baby, and um, you know we have done this. You know other people have done this, and a certain percentage of the time, uh, it's gonna there's gonna be a difference of opinion, and that certain percentage is probably closer to 25 than to two. You know, for example, um, and uh, you know and so this is a problem. And if we're gonna do sort of you know any sort of analysis, and this comes up all the time in terms of computer-based precision support and stuff like that. How you're gonna and so the best that we can do is that we did some sort of preliminary work um, that ties into the stuff that Ryan's doing, which is that if you get someone to do a clinical diagnosis and if you get someone, you know, one person to look at the picture, two people to look at the picture, three people to look at the picture, and if you combine their aggregated opinions, uh, it'll converge on what the most likely sort of correct answer is. Uh, and that's the method that we're trying to use to do the, you know, do the reference standard stuff for comparison. Have you identified any confounding conditions that would kind of mess up your your initial kind of stratification of low birth weight versus high birth weight? Because yeah. there are some pathologic conditions that result in high birth weight. I don't know if there's an association with retinal diseases, but just something to think about. Yeah, I don't know specifically. Uh, I don't know specifically about high birth weight, but I know that 
you know, it's something we're aware of, and it's going to have an impact on it. But it's, I don't know, as far as the cases that develop the retinopo retinopathy of prematurity, um, my understanding is, <coughs> like you said, that phenotype's pretty strong, so we can kind of trust that diagnosis for it. Um, I don't know if there's any other stuff that's really yeah. close that we need to take into account. Julie, I, don't, I think that's a great point. And um, in a way, it's kind of a chicken egg thing. You're trying to figure out what causes it. And if, I am, if I'm sort of paraphrasing your point, it's like, are there other things that could be causing it besides the things that we think that could be causing it, which is the stuff that Ryan was talking about? And um, it certainly could be. I mean, the thing that we've been trying to do is to collect all these different data points about these babies. Um, and then at the end of the day, you know, Ryan and Kamal or you know, other people do some analysis to see what really correlates. Is it the genes? Is it these other mysterious factors? Um, whatever. And then, you know, you know, the numbers will hopefully show what the answer is. But, um, you yeah, know, I don't know. I mean, in terms of that, you know, these so-called outliers, um, you know, the, so, you know, Ryan has helped sort out in general, if you're a baby and if you're small and if you're sick, you're likely to get disease. If you're big and you're healthy, you're not likely to get disease. And uh, you know, we sort of found a hundred babies who were either big and had disease, or small and did not have disease. Uh, and so they presumably had some protective or risk factor. Um, and uh, as far as we can tell, we looked at all the traditional risk factors and didn't find much difference between them. Uh, and so. We're sort of assuming that they had some predisposition to make them, uh, uh, you know, at risk or protected, and you know, do whole egg cell sequencing on those, and that'll be sort of, you know, what Ryan had to go at for his you know, thesis work, trying to correlate that with the clinical stuff, basically. And so, hopefully, it works. studies, you know, tens of millions of dollars of NIH money poured into, you know, characterizing, you know, who gets it, how do you treat it, when do you need to treat, how do you classify it, all that type of stuff. Um, why do people care? Um, because um, the stuff that causes this disease, it's blood vessels growing in the retina, and it's because that type of pathway also causes a lot of other diseases. Um, diabetic eye disease, uh, macular degeneration, cancers. Uh, and so, you know, it's not necessarily that. So, you know, why do people care about, you know, several hundred premature babies every year? It's because you can learn stuff about them that affects a lot of other people. And you don't have to wait 20 years for someone to get diabetic eye disease, you know. Um, <clears throat> so um, you get all that clinical characterization. And then, you know, we get these images, we sort of analyze these images, and, uh, you know, this, this person who many of you know, Jay Shui Kalpathy Kramer, uh, you know, is working with a group that, you know, for some reason she moved out to Boston, uh, you know, a couple years ago. <clears throat> and, um, uh, and so, you know, she's wor we're working with her and a group of people to characterize those images and try to quantify various features of them. And then, you know, uh, you know Ryan with people like Kamal, um, you know, do some genetic analysis. And um, at the end of the day, so that's a long prelude to my specific question, uh, <clears throat> which is what they um, want to do is figure out what genes are likely to cause this disease. Um, uh, what we can do with the clinical data and with the um, imaging data is figure out what are the parameters that identify bad disease. You know, you're vessels are tortuous, and we can put a number on it, and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, what we're hoping is to take these genetic data and take those clinical data and those imaging data together to create some holistic models for disease, and how the clinical stuff integrates with the genetic stuff, integrates with the imaging stuff. Um, uh, <clears throat> what mathematical modeling methods should we be using for that? 
and uh, what data needs to go into that model. Because that's, that's going to be part C, that you know, Kamal walked out on here, and we'll have to go report <laughs> back on. So I guess, let me just sort of leave it at that and pick everybody's brain about that. Because that, that, that's sort of essentially the, yeah. the, the end of the project. game. <laughs> I would jump to the type of graphical models that I was talking about the other day, where you can kind of see these interactions between different risk factors and genetic effects and measures on the, the images and tortuosity as a measure or whatever. You just think of you have some joint distribution between all those different effects and then try to weed out the, the connections that aren't important based on data. Of course, that depends on whether you have a large enough data set. That's the problem. Yeah, you generally need a lot of data for that. I mean, it sounds like from the start you're doing a type of logistic regression and just trying to see, like, <coughs> with, but you want to control for these other factors and whether you can throw in some of the imaging, like, uh, I don't know, measures that you get. The, yeah. real, the real trick is setting up what you consider the phenotype and, like, you know, finding a good quantitative measure for that and then trying to figure out, like, how the factors relate to it. I mean, the strength of graphical models is you can really ask specific hypotheses and whether they actually fit the data. So, I mean, it's, it can be a powerful technique, but you have to use it right. Or, or something like a lasso regression where you have a lot of different factors and you're looking for kind of a small minimum set that is the best predictor for that. And that's a way to kind of weed out a lot of different things. And they have a graphical lasso, too. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking for the genetic Glasso. stuff. Like, yeah. <laughs> Glasso? <laughs> Sorry, send me another question. Do you, this seems more, much more like hypothesis generation than hypothesis testing to me. Have you guys thought at all about, you know, the, the follow-up with this and what would you would do next, assuming you found, you know, some, uh, you know, significant associations? And um, that also gets into what you were talking about, Michael, about, uh, you know, applying this to other diseases. And so some of that follow-up could be in studying those genetic effects in these other eye diseases. I think that's a great point. Is this hypothesis generating or hypothesis driven kind of research? And um, that's actually one thing that we argued about a little bit in the call this morning. Because um, I, I think that, um, let me just digress for a second and say for those, I, I, I've, in my opinion, uh, there's a lot of question in the, in the bioinformatics literature <clears throat> about whether we're moving from hypothesis-driven to hypothesis-generating research because of these huge kind of data sets, or maybe research is getting to be kind of a combination. Um, <clears throat> so our argument this morning went something along the lines of, uh, should we be defining certain, so, so Ryan came up with this list of about 40 candidate genes based on neovascular, based on published literature involving neovascularization. And uh, we're trying to relate those candidate genes to different problems that could go wrong in the blood vessels. Like, you know, this gene affects the budding of blood vessels or something, and it may affect this quantitative feature. Um, uh, and so we're trying to piece together a table that links those types of things. Um, so the biologists are pushing us to do exactly that, to do something that makes rational sense. Uh, and then we'll test that in the... Um, uh, uh, model, you know, once we get the genetic data to see if it really fits um, what's happening. So I guess in that sense, it's um, hypothesis generating, or it, it's um, hypothesis driven. Um, uh, Jay Cherie made the point on this morning's call that shouldn't this table of clinical phenotype, imaging phenotype, and genetic phenotype be the result of the study <clears throat> based on what the data shows about what correlates with what. And so that's sort of the hypothesis driven part. And what we ended up with is that it's a little bit of both because, um, you know, you generate your questions 
from that hypothesis-driven stuff, test to see if it works, and then you come up with that end result, which may be, you know, what fits the data or whatever, and hopefully it kind of makes sense. That's a really long answer yeah. to say that it's hopefully a little bit of, um, you know, both of those things. What, what do you think? Well, I think the, the answer has to do with what, again, what you're going to do afterward. I mean, if you're really trying to do you know, hypothesis testing, you have to have an enumerated set of hypotheses, you have to correct for multiple testing, all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't even know if you're going to wind up with a big enough sample size to, you know, have uh, en enough, you know, en enough discrimination. But, uh, you know, if you look at it from a hypothesis generation point of view, you can cast a somewhat wide net because then you have a that implies that there's a plan to follow this up. A lot of the hypothesis generation stuff that I'm familiar with in the literature, what they, they kind of do what you're doing is they create a hypothesis from some sort of text mining approach, and then they go back and review the literature to see if there's, if they can construct a story that supports that conclusion based on the existing literature. Um, you know, maybe there's a paper that's published that's very similar or th to the generated hypothesis or it's a very similar process in a different organ or a related disease or something and they sort of make this inference that, you know, there's, there's reason to believe this might really be true and not just some kind of statistical anomaly. And then, you know, but it can't ever end in that because you don't actually know anything. You just know that you've got a good question to ask. So, you know, I don't know if there are good, you know, you know mouse disease models. It seems like there are because yeah. there's been some testing and you can do, you know, gene knockouts and different kinds of things that, you know, really test that specific hypothesis in kind of a, a causal way. Because, right, this is all association and association doesn't imply causality necessarily. So I, I would go more in the hypothesis generating direction. I guess, I guess Jishiri and I tend to think alike in this way. I think that one of the... <clears throat> um, I love this discussion, and I think that one of the um, uh, ch challenges is that at the end of the day, what we'd like to do with this is create some sort of tools that are useful for real doctors. Um, and I think that people will tend to believe things more if there's a rationale for why it, why it makes sense. Um, now, that said, I, I, I'm a little bit cynical that I think doctors often don't really know why they make decisions or why they sort of do things a certain way or there are probably these patterns that go on in their minds that, you know, they can't really articulate. Um, but, but, I mean, I think that's an argument to try to, you know, for the hypothesis-driven stuff that it makes sense to people. Um, but really, I, I, I'm sort of, I think it would be great to be able to, you know, have the Jayshiris of the world create diagnostic tools based on images and to have the Ryans and the Kamals of the world create sort of diagnostic tools based on, um, mm -hmm. uh, based on genetic stuff, who's at risk. And then at the end, they were going to try to put it together as some prototype for a genome-enabled EHR, you know, that combines the genetics with the clinical stuff. I mean, I kind of look at that as, as hypothesis generating in that, you know, the hypothesis that you're generating is that you know, this is a good multimodal predictive model that will be useful clinically. And then, so you need another data set to validate that model, which is then hypothesis testing, because the hypothesis is that the model is actually useful, <laughs> right? So, you know, I, I think it's all sort of part of this process. It's obviously the difficulty in this is getting enough data to do that. Yeah. It seems to me like the hypothesis generation makes more sense because th there seems to be like this timing component of like when the blood vessels stop forming and if you can hold them off for a little while then they can reform. So stuff that's just about blood vessel formation genes that just influence that, it might have, you know, they might be a more regulatory aspect of which genes really have the effect based on the timing of formation of these two separate things, especially since there's such a big component for like environmental factors and, you know, with preterm birth and stuff. Having, having a, a gene list like you compiled with those 40 genes could be really useful if you're looking at like genetic interactions where you're looking at combinations of genes because in that case, you know, looking at all combinations of 20,000 genes is impossible. Yeah. You can't do it. But looking at all combinations of 40 genes, like two, three, four combination, you can do that. Yeah. So that's a good point. 
That's it. Thanks.